So anyway, hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm the architect at Proofpoint. Uh, I'm in charge of our information protection uh, systems, which is a bunch of different products uh, that provide security around uh, SaaS applications, so uh, files on public clouds, uh, logins, stuff like that. Uh, so we monitor a whole bunch of different data uh, for our customers who, for example, use uh, Google Apps or OneDrive or S3, and we can detect unauthorized access, protect files, scan content, all kinds of stuff. That's not what I'm going to talk about. This is just the intro of you know why I'm even here. Uh, yeah. The mic. Yeah. That's, uh, whoa. That that was way too loud for me. Is is that better? Because you guys can move closer. Anyway. Um, so at Proofpoint, it, it, Proofpoint's a big company, it's uh, 2,500 uh, 2, employees or so, we have about 1,000 engineers, um, and we have a whole bunch of different products. We have a bunch of product groups, and because Proofpoint tends to just buy companies rather than you know, hire engineers, because it's cheaper to buy engineers, um, we tend to be very distributed in terms of what group does what, right? So every group has something that they've built, and this leads to those two weird things like we use we use four different types of container infrastructure in production because uh, the Proofpoint core team built their own thing with Kubernetes. Um, the group I work for, which was a company that got acquired, we have our own infrastructure for running container, which is a mix, uh, containers with a mix of Docker and uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we recently bought a third company which has all of their containers nicely running on Google Cloud uh, in managed Kubernetes, and we have a bunch of other different things. So on the one hand, it's weird, and we eventually need to converge to one thing. On the other hand, I get to play around with a bunch of different technologies, and it's pretty cool. So you can look at what different things have to offer to you and decide on what works best. Um, so with that, let's actually start talking about containers in production, because we have a lot of them. Uh, so quick, uh, quick survey. Who here actually knows about containers? Has read something online? Has heard the buzzwords, Docker, Kubernetes, all that stuff? Good. Who here actually uses containers for something? It's less, but okay, still good. Who here actually uses containers in production for something customer facing that real people use? Okay, that's like 12 people. Um, who here actually manages stuff related to deploying things to, to containers in production? One, two, three, seven people. All right, cool, this is, this is, this is a good mix, it's a good mix. So I don't need to explain what containers are and why you would even use them, this is good, it saves us like 20 minutes. Um, so let's talk about, fine, you know about containers, you can use them, you maybe you know, went and did Docker run hello world on your laptop, it seems to work. We're not sure how this translates to production, but that's fine. Um, and now the next step is how you can actually take this and use this for something useful in production. And there's a whole bunch of different issues that you have to solve as a developer, not, not as a DevOps, right? This is not a DevOps talk. Uh, before you can have your code running in the container in production. It seems fairly uh, weird because you, know, you just create a Docker file and give it to the DevOps, and the DevOps takes care of all of the other stuff. But th that's not really the case, especially not for complex applications, and especially if you're not building something from scratch, if you have an existing application running on VMs or whatever, uh, and you need to take that, and you need to containerize it, and you move it to production, which is the case for most companies right now, right? No, very few companies get to build something completely from scratch and go into containers right away and build everything correctly the first time. Uh, I don't think I've ever built anything correctly the first time. Um, and in our case, for example, we have a bunch of different pro projects. Some are already on con running containers. Some are like half and half in the middle of transitioning. Some are still entirely on VMs, and we're all moving towards getting a uh, common container infrastructure. But it's a long way, and there's just a bunch of stuff we need to do on the way. Um, so obviously, first of all, I I'm sure uh, I don't need to explain why you even want to do containers, right? There's usually a lot, a lot of different reasons, but the main ones are you want to do some bin packing, you want to run more services in fewer uh, machines or in, in less uh, resources or use your resources better. Uh, you want to be able to manage deployment infrastructure as code, right? You want to write some kind of declarative file 
that explains how to run your application, store it with the source code, and then the infrastructure can take, care, take that and run it. You don't need to go and you manually declare dependencies and stuff like that. Um, and you wouldn't be able to uh, do this consistently. You want to have the same environment running everywhere on your machine, in QA, in dev, uh, and in production. And all of these things, they're kind of related to developers, but it's mostly DevOps and architecture and stuff like that. So what do, dev, what do developers actually get out of it and what do they need to put into it? Uh, well, first of all, uh, your deployment, your Docker files are code, right? They sit with your uh, application. Who here actually uh, ha has written a Docker file ever in their life? It's like, okay, so for, for the other 25-ish percent, let's take a look at one real quick. Uh, is the font okay? Should I make it bigger? Okay, we'll go with this for now. Um, so we have a very simple Node.js application. Why Node? Because, what? Well, well, why not? Um, and it's a very simple application. All we have to do is declare how to run it in a container, how to build an image around it. Um, so w usually when you go and you create a container, you don't just build it from scratch. You don't import the entire Linux stack into your container. You start with a base image. So w in this case, we're starting with Node Boron which goes and it imports from some more upstream based Linux image. Just tell it which application to take, uh, what to run in order to actually package and build all the dependencies, copy the source output into the container, and then which command starts the application in the container, right? So that's just about the simplest uh, Docker file you can imagine. We export port 6060, and if we want to go into the application, um, then it will run on port 6060. So if you want to build the whole thing, we just do docker build, uh, give it some, uh, some version, tell it to build the whole thing, it goes and runs all the commands. I already had it cached, obviously, because I want to wait. But you can see it does all the commands, this, the eight commands I had in the docker file, it ran all of them, and it created an image, it tagged it with a version. The convention is some kind of repository slash the application name and the version. And if we go and we look for the image, uh, Docker. And yeah, we can see it's in there. And this is the new tag we just created. Uh, by the way, you will see sometimes Docker images tag this latest. And it gets, it's, it confuses people who use proper versioning systems like Maven or NPM or anything where latest would imply that this is literally the latest version. It's not, it's just a string. It doesn't mean anything. You don't have, just because it says latest, it uh, doesn't mean it's actually latest. This one is not, in fact, the latest. Uh, so don't get confused. Uh, the convention is if you're deploying uh, your images to some package repository, you tag them as latest if it is indeed latest, but it's not enforced in any way. Um, anyway, so we, as you saw, we got a base image. Uh, so the first thing as a developer you have to consider is what base image you're going to use, right? It obviously depends on the technology you intend to run in the container. So if you're running Node.js, you have to build, in, build it on some kind of base image which A, knows how to run NPM and a bunch of other stuff. So it needs to have all the tools installed. It needs to have Node installed in the base image. And it needs to be able to actually execute your application after it's done building. So for Node, that's pretty simple. For something like .NET, that they gets a bit more complicated. Who here writes .NET? It's like, wow, that's 80%-ish. Who here does not write .NET? Let's, let's try it this way. It's the same people. <laughs> it, the same people raised hands. That, that makes no sense. OK, let's try it different. Who here writes Java? Who here does not write Java? Are you just raising different hands to confuse me? <laughs> So like everybody writes everything, excellent. We'll talk about all the languages. Um, so anyway, Java and .NET, I mentioned those two specifically because they all have this weird duality where you have uh, one way to build the image and then you need uh, some sort of runtime environment to run the actual application. So you know uh, the whole .NET stack to build it and then CLR to run it, Java obviously the same. You have to have the JDK to build the Java application and then the uh, JRE to actually run it. Um, now if you go and you take your average .NET application, and this is on Mac, by the way, so it works really well. We're just going to go with .NET Core, uh, not necessarily something I would do in production, but for our, for our example, it looks pretty good. Uh, it's a very simple application. All it does is hello world. I think we can all agree that's pretty much the simplest thing you can do. 
Um, and so to build a Docker file for this application, what do we have to do? We have to declare some kind of base image. This is obviously a, a prepared image that Microsoft have uploaded to, to Docker Hub. Um, and it contains all the tools you will ever need to build a, do, a .NET Core application, right? So it has the SDK, the compiler, all the dependencies. Uh, there's a, another image for ASP.NET, which has even more dependencies. And so if you want to build it, it's very easy. All we have to do is run .NET build minus C. That builds the application. And then the entry point is .NET run. And we tell it to run the application. So this image can do everything. It can compile. It can well, it can compile, it can build, it can run, all we want to do. So if you go and we actually build this image, so go and build it, and, and it, it runs uh, Microsoft Build Engine, restores packages, all this fun stuff is going to take about 30 seconds, and eventually it after it finishes building, it takes all the output, builds it into a, an image, and then we have the image. We can actually run it if we want. Run. And the whole thing runs. I don't know if you see it, but it did say hello world right there. Success, .NET running in containers on a Mac. I'm not sure we can find something even weirder than that, but we'll try. Um, okay, so. This brings us to the next point. The base image, uh, let's look at how much data we actually stored with this one Hello World application. So, um, let's do it like this. Right, so as you can see, this is our image, and the size of it is, it starts here. It's 1.76 gigabytes. That's a lot for Hello World. Uh, and the reason it's uh, almost two gigabytes is because we basically have half a Visual Studio in that image, right? Or .NET Core, blah, blah, all that stuff. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, and if we update it and we put a, a, new, a new version, we have to build another two gig image and then run that. And it takes a long time. And this is obviously a terrible thing. Uh, but luckily, and uh, very uh, re relatively recently, about a year ago, uh, Docker have added a new feature called multi-stage builds. So multi-stage builds, how, how many people have actually used it or at least heard of it? It's like, okay, cool. That, that's actually a very good point because it exists for a long time. A lot of people uh, use base images. Very few people, oddly enough, know about multi-stage builds and use them. So what does multi-stage builds uh, do? All it does is actually define two separate Docker, base Docker images, one to build the, the application and one to run it, which is exactly what we want. So all we had to change in our Docker file is we have a separate Im uh, build image for the building part, right? So it's the same one, the same we used earlier, the Microsoft.NET 2.1 SDK. We build it, we just run the uh, output, and then we take the output of that image and we create a new image based on that. And the new image is actually based on Microsoft.NET 2.1 runtime. And for Java, you can do the same, obviously, right? For Java, you can have a JDK image to build your Java artifacts, and then a JRE image, which is much smaller, to actually copy your output and run it. So as you can see, it copies from this image. Build is just the alias, right? So here it's named build. It copies this folder from the build and then simply runs .NET app DLL in our much slimmer uh, runtime image. So if we do this, let's see how much this changes. Um, yeah, making the problem bigger is a good idea. How would you do that? There we go. Bigger? Even bigger? We can go bigger. <laughs> All right. So we just use the other Docker file we created with a multi-stage build. Uh, we'll tag it. And then, as you can see, it's actually using the SDK image for a building, and then once it's done, it actually uses the other base image for building the, uh, the second level, uh, the second stage. So if you go to images, we can see that we have our multi-stage image, and it's 180 megabytes. 
So exactly one tenth the size, almost exactly one tenth the size, right? And so if we do that uh, and we deploy it to production, it's going to be better in every possible way. Um, and you can see it, the base images that we bring in to compile them, they're about the right size. So if you have the runtime for basic .NET applications, it's, uh, let me raise the text a bit. So the basic runtime itself is 180 megabytes. The Hello World application didn't add anything. It added like a few kilobytes. And if you want to run ASP core, it has a few more dependencies, but it, the base image is 255 megabytes and not two gigs as uh, would be the full image. So this is one thing, if you're gonna use Docker, this is the first thing you have to start using. And this applies obviously not just for .NET and uh, Java and stuff, it applies to anything anything at all where you have a separate build stage and a separate run stage. So if it's Node app, you have, you know, you have to minify scripts, run Gradle, whatever have you. If it's a Go app, you have to actually run Go, Go, like Go tools and compile it and then copy the output. Pretty much anything except maybe a bash script uh, would be a good candidate for multi-stage builds. And even with bash, you know, there's, there's stuff to consider. All right, so multi-stage builds, there's a reason I put this up front because it's really, if there's only one thing you remember for this entire talk is use multi-stage builds, right? So you don't, wanna, you don't wanna deploy two gigabyte images to production. Um, all right, so moving on to the actual useful part, which is, okay, so we have a base image. Woohoo! how do we run it? Obviously running it locally is very easy, as you all saw, I run docker run, give it the name of the image, and it runs it. And if it's a long running application, it will continue running in the background. Uh, so we can do something like, we have our node app. up, daemon, right, and so it, it then does not run because, there we go, and as you can see, it's running, it has the application, it opens the port, all the fun stuff that happens. Um, okay, so that's just running it on my machine, that's not super useful, it's nice if you wanna run local stuff, I have something like 30 different images stored on my laptop for all kinds of things. So I have like five versions of Elasticsearch, five versions of MySQL, uh, all so I can play around and build stuff locally on my machine. It's super convenient as a developer that you don't have to go and you know spin up a server or you don't have to uh, install competing versions of the same database on locally. You can just have 20 different images and run whichever one you want. Uh, this makes my life much easier. It doesn't really translate into production, but it's already a nice thing to have where you have a nice library of local images and you can run whatever you need at that moment to develop stuff. Um, however, if you actually want to run this in production, we'll talk about other more important stuff like you know logging and metrics and uh, making sure they stay up and upgrades and all that in a bit. But for now, let's talk about how you would even run it. So you need some kind of a runtime environment, right? So runtime environment, uh, that would be either Docker or some kind of container engine to run it. So that would be Docker or Rocket and if you're on CoreOS or LXC, there's a bunch of different uh, things that can run containers. Um, and underneath that, it's all basically just Linux uh, C groups. There, there, there was an interesting talk two years ago here by a guy from Uber where he actually built his own like very simple Docker with nothing but bash scripts. Right. It's just using basic Linux commands to create you know, containers and isolations and isolated networks. It's really cool. If you look it up on the uh, Build Stuff website, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but look from two years ago in the Uber, you'll find it. Um, but if you want to actually use actual tools, we need to actually, first of all, have a way to define what we want to run. We have our Docker, app, Docker image, but it's just one image. Usually applications don't come in just one item, right? You have dependencies, you have a database, we have a bunch of services. Is everyone using microservices now? Yes, who doesn't use microservices? Who thinks microservices are a terrible idea? That was a trick question, but anyway, well done. <laughs> it, it, I don't know. Um, but yeah, pretty much everyone uses microservices now, except for that gentleman over there who is correctly uh, avoiding them. Um, and you don't just deploy one application or one service. You have a bunch of them, and they have dependencies, and they need to know where to find each other. So for that, you need to be able to define some kind of stack, some kind of application stack, Preferably, again, declaratively, because we, we like de and declaring things like Docker files in code, and we can store them and run them and have versioning and all that cool stuff. Um, and so once we declare the application stack, we can say, okay, we have service A, it depends on service B, it needs to be able to find it. Uh, and I, have, I want to have three copies of service A, and I want to have five copies of service B, and to scale them out separately. And it will be very convenient to define that. So for that, we have several options. Um, 
there is this debate about Docker versus Kubernetes, right? Docker not as a container engine, but as an or orchestrator, as the thing that runs the containers, versus Kubernetes, which is, again, not a runtime engine. It, it's the orchestrator for running containers and managing them. Uh, and there is pretty clear uh, preference for using Kubernetes. It's not as simple as that because Kubernetes is very complicated, right? So uh, having you actually use it a lot in production, it's pretty complicated to set up. You don't necessarily want to, to use something really big and heavy and full featured if you just want something very simple. For example, we have a, uh, one of our projects is deploying a VM, a single VM on-prem for a client, and there's like 20 things that need to run in that VM. And it's very convenient to have a very simple way to define the stack and run it, uh, and we considered Kubernetes for a while, and then we discovered that Kubernetes needs like half of that VM just for itself, for its CPU and memory and all that stuff. And we had half of the memory and the CPU left for our own stuff. And so we said, no, thank you, Kubernetes. For this one, we're just gonna use Docker Compose, which is a very simple way to define uh, stacks in Docker and run them on a single machine. So let's take a look. We have three things to look at, right? We have Docker Compose, which is uh, a way to run a stack locally on a single VM. We have Docker Swarm, which is a clustered uh, management service that Docker has built into it. Uh, and it lets you connect several VMs or several machines into one giant pool of resources. And when you create containers, they'll go to one of those machines and you can kind of control where they go. And Kubernetes, obviously, you have a whole cluster of uh, uh, worker nodes. You have uh, one or more manager uh, machines which manage all the worker nodes. And they decide which container runs where and they kept, take care of them and all that stuff. And so Docker Swarm is very simple to set up and Docker uh, Compose doesn't actually need anything to set up. So let's take a look. Right. Um, actually, let's just look over here because it's simpler. So Docker Compose uses what are called Compose files. Pretty much everything from here on is gonna be YAML files. If you don't like YAML, uh, you can just leave. Um, uh, so Docker Compose gives us a declarative way above the Docker file to c declare the relationships between different uh, services, which base images they use, how many of them they need, uh, how they behave, what their policy for scaling and replicating is, and all that stuff, all in one neat file, and then we run it and it will create however many images or however many containers we defined in the stack. So in this case, let's look at a very simple uh, Docker Compose example. Uh, we declare services, we have two of them, right? We have one uh, service called web, one service called Redis. The Redis service has no declarations besides telling it which image to use, so it's gonna bring the Redis Alpine image from Docker Hub and run it, and it will give it the service name uh, Redis, and Docker Compose and Docker Swarm take care of actually doing DNS resolution and service discovery for us. If we go and we try to uh, resolve the host name Redis, it will hit this service within the stack. All right, so that already takes care of all the stuff like service dependencies and resolutions. If we go and we search for the service name, we'll just find the service, that's the, that machine. The web service is actually slightly uh, more complex. It uses our uh, Compose image, which I built earlier. Um, we can tell it how to build it. It will just build it in the local folder. And then we can specify how to deploy it. So for deployment, the initial configuration is we have three replicas of this, so it will actually create three containers of the service. Uh, and we can specify a bunch of other things. I, mean, I didn't actually put all of them in here because it would be a very long list. Just, just a few of the more important ones. So restart policy. If the container dies for any reason uh, and it exits with an error code, it, the um, manager Docker Compose will bring it back up. Uh, if it stops and exits with a zero error code, which means it just stopped, it will not get resurrected, only if it actually fails. And update, which is important because, so right now, if we run this, we'll have one, uh, one version of this image running. Uh, what happens when we go and we rebuild the image? We update the application, we want to update it. Uh, we don't wanna just bring everything down and bring up a new stack. That's gonna give us a, a certain amount of downtime. So here we can specify the update config par parallelism. So we'll say, we'll update images in groups of two and we'll wait 10 seconds in between, between each one, each group, to give them time uh, to actually come back up before you update the next set. Uh, and there's a bunch of other things you can configure here when we'll talk about them a bit later. But for now, th that's the stuff. Uh, so how do we run this? We just do docker compose up. Uh, and so as you can see, it creates two containers. 
this one and this one, brings them both up, uh, and each image is built from a Docker file, it exposes its own ports, all that stuff, and we can now go and actually look that it's running. We actually go into a browser and do, I think it was this port, yep. And so it's actually a very simple uh, Python application. It uses Redis and stores this counter in Redis. It can find it. It's very simple and as you can see, we spun up two different services in one command. They're all up. We can also obviously kill them in a single command. Should bring them down. But again, this all happens on my machine, right? This is already useful for production. In our case, for example, at Proofpoint right now, we run a bunch of stuff uh, in Docker Compose in uh, single static VMs, uh, as opposed to having some kind of something cluster that we manage. We have a bunch of our build stuff, build infrastructure running in Docker Compose. For example, we have component tests. So in, in the system uh, we built for data processing, we have a lot of non-interactive web services. So it's a service that listens to a uh, queue, uh, reads from a Kafka topic, does something, puts it in a different Kafka topic. Doesn't have a REST API, doesn't do anything com complicated, but it's also very hard to test, right? How you can't just bring the service up, give it some input and expect an output. You have to bring up the service, you have to bring up an instance of Apache Kafka, you have to write some stuff into one topic, let the service process it, wait for the output and then read the output and that's your component test. So doing that uh, as a unit test is very difficult, uh, but if you wrap this in just a very simple Docker Compose uh, stack, uh, you can run this as a single test in your CI pipeline, right? So when we build this service, part of the build process actually creates a Docker stack, brings up Kafka, brings up the service that, sh that provides the input, lets the service run, reads the output, compares the two, and then the test, the test passes or fails, right? And all of that is nicely encapsulated in a single uh, YAML file that we can just specify and the developers maintain it and add new tests to it. Um, and so this is already very, very useful without you know, scaling it out or clustering or anything like that. Uh, but obviously the next, uh, next step would be, all right, we've done all the stuff on one machine, we've reached the limit of what actually is useful to do on one machine, how do we run this in production in a big cluster where I have you know, hundreds of VMs or however many VMs you want, I wanna be able to scale out, I wanna manage my resources, all that stuff. This is where Docker uh, Swarm or Kubernetes come in. So going back to the slide, um, Swarm is just a way to tell Docker here are X machines, use them as one resource pool. And then when you create a stack from a YAML file like this, it's not gonna be built on one machine, it's just gonna spread the containers over however many worker machines are in that stack. Kubernetes is slightly more complicated. Uh, there's a bit more abstraction levels above uh, the single container. You create what's called a deployment, again, a YAML file, get used to writing lots of YAML. Um, and then in the YAML file, you define how to run uh, your images or your applications, and then on top of that you create a service uh, which lets you expose your uh, deployments as uh, external REST endpoints, and there's a few other uh, layers of abstraction you have on top of that, but basically it's the same thing, you define your stack, your uh, what services run and how they interact with each other, and then you tell the orchestrator, here, run this. How does it look? It looks something like this. For Docker, uh, find the thing. Right, so for Docker Compose, it's exactly the same thing. I can just run this, instead of uh, Compose, I can run it as a stack. Let's take a look uh, real quick. Instead of, I can't blame him. I, I'd go as well, but I'm, I'm kind of supposed to do this. Right, so we replace uh, Docker Compose with Docker Stack. Docker Stack tells the Swarm cluster to take the stack and deploy it. Uh, the file is the same Docker Compose YAML and this is a, I don't know, let's call it test. Uh, sorry, minus C. And so it does all the stuff I told it, right? So it creates the, a virtual network, it creates uh, our web service and our, and our Redis service. And now, if I had multiple machines, this would, I wouldn't actually know where, which machines they are running on. They'd be somewhere in the Docker Swarm cluster, uh, but we can go and take a look at Docker stack less, and we have several stacks already running. I have some other stuff for demos later that running, and this is our test stack. We can go and we uh, can look at all the services. So we can see that right now, test Redis is running, it has a name, it has one replica, and test web is running also in our swarm cluster. I'll raise it a bit. 
and it's got three replicas running, and this is the image it's actually using. So it's very easy to manage. We can go and scale it out. We can say something like docker uh, scale, sorry, uh, we can tell it to scale out a service, right? So our test service, that's the web service within the stack, we just scale it out to five instances instead of uh, three. So we can do docker service, sorry, let me clear the screen so you can see it. So you can see that this is actually running with five replicas right now. We can update it, we can tell it to uh, use a new image, we can build a new image with a different version and update it, and it will actually run and go and uh, swap in nodes one by one until all of them are built to the new image. Right, and so this is already very useful, it's very simple. Um, if you're new to this, this is much easier to use, in my opinion, than Kubernetes. Uh, when you're a big company and you have a large dev team and you have a large DevOps team, Kubernetes has a lot more other options which are also useful. So let's kill this stack. Removing a stack is just that simple. You just killed old containers, cleaned up everything, removed the new virtual network, and then we can take a look and those services are no longer, no longer running. Uh, stop the other one as well. Um, so with Kubernetes, I actually have a mini Kubernetes cluster running uh, here. If you want to play around with Kubernetes, there is a deployment called Minikube, uh, which is a, sing a single node version of Kubernetes, which you can run. And it's, uh, it actually spins up a VM with all the stuff Kubernetes needs with the management node inside of it. And you can play around and uh, uh, do all your Kubernetes stuff in that. So for Kubernetes, as I said, we have a very similar concept to Docker Stacks. It's called a deployment. If we go and we look at the deployment, it pretty much specifies all the same things that uh, the, uh, the Docker Compose stack does. So for example, we have a new template for an app called Node App, which is the same we had earlier. Uh, we specify which image it comes from and which ports it exposes. Um, I added some more stuff here just to, uh, to show them. You can specify resource limits, CPU, memory limits. These are actually important because by default, if you don't specify them, um, some, some types of applications don't behave well with Docker. Uh, as an example, uh, until version 2.03, .NET Core wouldn't detect the container CPU and memory limits. It would actually use the host's memory limits and, and CPU limits, and it would completely mess up garbage collection and it will try to build too big of a heap. Java, uh, if you're using Java uh, version 8, before patch three, uh, 131, um, it doesn't detect CPU uh, of the container. It detects the CPU of the host. It also doesn't detect the memory of the container. It detects the memory of the host, and it automatically uh, spins up a heap the same size as the host, unless you manually tell it the heap size, which most people normally do. But if you, don't, if you forget to give a specific heap size, it will just try to use the entire host, and if you have multiple containers, they'll actually uh, mostly just crash with other memory exceptions. Um, so CPU limits and memory limits are important. Again, by default, there is no CPU limit, right? So the container will use all the CPUs on the host unless you tell it or tell the orchestrator to actually limit it. Um, and uh, we'll talk about other stuff uh, like liveness in a bit. So how do you actually run this? I'm too lazy to actually type all this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste and you guys will forgive me because I'm sure everyone appreciates just how lazy developers are. Um, so what we do is we can just create a new application. This is pretty much equivalent to what I did earlier with Docker stack deploy, all that. Uh, so this now has actually run this application. We can do kubectl get pods. Uh, pods are the abstraction top of containers that uh, Kubernetes runs, and we can see that this is now running a single deployment. Now this deployment is, is running, but it's not actually, actually exposed to anything. Right? If we go and we look at the Kubernetes cluster in the management console, Let's look at it right here. This is our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's very sad and lonely on a single machine. Uh, but if we look at it, we'll see that we now have one deployment. So we have one node app running. It's been running for 30 seconds. Let me uh, make it a bit bigger. It's running this image, right? And uh, it's not exposed to anything. It's just inside the cluster. So if we had other applications running inside the stack, it, they would be able to find it. But out from outside the, the cluster, I can't see it. Right, I can't access it or anything else. In order to be able to access it, we have to expose it as a service. In order to expose it as a service, 
we have to actually create a service. And so we go and tell Kubernetes to expose this application as a service. And we can see that now we have our node app exposed as a service. It has an IP and all that stuff. We can tell Minikube service node app to actually open it for us. And there we go. It actually opens us, uh, signs a random port to it, opens the node app, and the node app uh, is actually running in the cluster. Uh, and we can do all kinds of stuff with it. We can scale it. We can uh, uh, spin it up. We can upgrade it and do all the interesting stuff we want with Kubernetes. Um, so let's say we want to update the application, right? Let's build a new version of it. Um, let's say we have our node app. Server. It's going to take a while to write server this way. Um, so let's say we change something here. This is VI, don't be scared. Um, all right, over here. Do you guys know how to exit VI? <laughs> Have you seen the memes? All right, so let's build a new application. It's built, very nice. Uh, and now we want to update it. Um, of course. In this case, all we have to do is go and update our deployment, right? So the deployment for the node app, which is allowed to use the new image. Uh, and so if we now update it, it will go and update the image. And now if we discard deployment, we can see that it is now using the correct image. And the log is uh, that it actually Scale, back down, scale it down to zero and then scale it up to uh, one again because we only had one instance of the container running, so it killed it and it brought, brought back up a new one with the new app. And if we go and, we, uh, and refresh the uh, screen, we hope we see that it actually is updated now. I didn't actually have to do much, right? I just provided a new image and everything got updated. If we had multiple copies of it, we wouldn't actually have downtime. It would have replaced one, uh, one replica at a time. Right, and so this is actually very convenient, and as you can see, um, let's delete all this stuff, because I have other things to do with it later. Um, so this is actually very interesting, very, um, very useful as a developer to be able to take all of your code, specify the stack, specify how it gets exposed, what it gets exposed externally, what is only internal, and then put it in one file, or two files in this case, and then run it. Unfortunately, there's more than two files. In Kubernetes, there's like seven different things you have to template. We haven't talked about secrets and passwords yet. We haven't talked about logging and metrics and a bunch of other things. So it gets complicated. And this is why uh, there exists a tool called Helm. It's pretty much the de facto standard of how you deploy stuff to Kubernetes. Um, Helm takes all of these deployments that we have, you have to build, uh, YAML files that we need to package, packages them into a single uh, tar file, a zipped file, and then you can use that as a whole deployment and store it in some kind of repository. So you have a meta repository, right? You have a repository for your Docker images, and you have a repository for your deployments where you can go and have, get a prepackaged stack and run it. And the Helm takes care of actually getting the stack, expanding it, running all the different scripts and stack uh, configurations, and spinning up a whole new application just for you. The way it works is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, you know what, let's uh, just build one ourselves real quick. Uh, so Helm has a uh, configuration script called charts. You know, let's look at it in the browser. It's in an editor. It's much easier. Um, go over here. There we go, charts. So you can see Helm just creates a chart, which is the YAML file, which describes our package, our deployment. We're about to package a whole system, right? You can put as many containers or as many deployments into a Helm package as you want. For example, we can have a whole website packaged as a single Helm chart or a whole database or anything, right? And inside of it, it creates templates with, which are ex actually all the same YAML files we saw earlier, right? So we have a deployment YAML here with a bunch of pre-configured stuff. Uh, we have our service YAML here, which is a bunch of pre-configured stuff. 
right? It's all the same files we had uh, earlier, or all the same configurations we had earlier for similar to Docker Swarm, similar to Kubernetes. Now we can actually just uh, run this as a simple, um, as a single package in uh, in one place, and then we can package it. So something like this: Helm package. I can't remember the syntax for it, which is why I'm going to cheat. Um, oh, fairly simple. So Helm. Uh, And so we have this chart. Uh, we can actually now upload it to a package repository and it's gonna stay there and we can run it uh, with a simple Helm install. So if you do, for example, Helm search, uh, let's get something uh, ready-made, WordPress. Right, so the uh, online Helm repository has a bunch of prepared charts, like WordPress. WordPress is a whole website that has a database, it has a bunch of stuff in it, and a web server and PHP, and we just wanna run it. So Helm install WordPress. Um, oh, stable WordPress. We'll actually download the package, expand it, get all the templates out of it, and actually spin up all the deployments, all the services, all of the stuff uh, for me. And all I have to do is wait for it to actually come up and go to the correct URL. So if we go to, now to kubectl, get pods, we can see that there are some pods spinning up. They're not ready yet. We'll talk in a bit about how Kubernetes actually knows if they're ready or not. Uh, but once they become uh, ready, we can go and we can use our WordPress website. As you can see, it's spinning up a WordPress instance and a MariaDB instance all in one package. All right, so we can take a look, and one of them is now ready. Uh, you can look at services. The service is actually already spinning up as well. Um, Okay, we can go and we can take a look at our new website here in the deployments. You can see that there is a there are two deployments here for the database and the WordPress, and we have our services defined here. We're waiting for them to spin up, but this one is already up. It has an external IP. Um, so this one. Well, it's still staying up because uh, the website takes a while. But anyway, once it actually goes up, we'll have a whole WordPress website running uh, in our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and clean, uh, cleaning up after ourselves is actually very easy. We just delete the whole, uh, the whole package and it's done. Um, so this, uh, this is what actually we at Proofpoint use uh, our core team built infrastructure on top of Kubernetes that actually simplifies the process to do this for developers. Uh, you have to go to an, like, an online form, fill in the name of your source code repository and a couple of parameters, click save, and it generates the Helm uh, charts for you. It builds and packages all of them for you and uploads the package to the general repository. And then if you wanna deploy your package from your code, you can just run uh, either from a website or run a script which takes all of your stack from your code and uploads it to the uh, managed cluster uh, of Kubernetes and it just starts running, right? And uh, this makes it that developers can go from actually writing code to running something in production in about 15 minutes, right? I've actually had test services I had to deploy for some other stuff for to, to test the database and writing code, packaging it and running the whole thing in a real cluster in dev took about 15 minutes. So this is where we actually start reaping the benefits of um, uh, using proper deployment tools. So we talk about this, uh, a bit about logging and, mon and monitoring and metrics because um, this always comes up. Once you actually move from running single instance via single applications on VMs or anything else to containers, you have to reconsider how you actually think about logging and metrics of your applications, right? Because normally when you go and you look at metrics for non-container applications, you go to a machine and you look at the metrics, you know, CPU of the process on this machine, and usually it looks uh, very structured and very hierarch uh, in a very clear hierarchy where you have VMs and you have processes running in VMs and you have your application. 
With containers, it's much more amorphous, right? Uh, individual containers can go up and down, and uh, the cluster can decide to reallocate them somewhere else. You might have updated them. And so containers constantly change. There's no point in saving the name of the container, unlike a VM where you have, let's say, web one, web two, and web three, which would be you know, a common example somewhere. Um, and so there's no point looking at individual containers because they can disappear and then they'll come back. There's no history you can look at for a container. And so you have to start thinking about the whole application as a single thing, uh, which is the aggregation of all the metrics and logs you collected over time for that application. You can't just go and in inspect an individual container. You have to be able to look at the state of the whole application, which pretty much means you have to go from logging at the machine level, where you just write to a file, to shipping all of your logs and, all and, and shipping the metrics from, from the application to some kind of central collection service where it will um, aggregate everything and be able to uh, present it to you um, at the application level. And if you scale out the application, you should be able to see uh, the, let's say, the CPU usage grow because there's more containers now. But you shouldn't have to go and dig into each one individually. So just as a very quick example of that, before we uh, were fin finished, uh, we can look at a very simple logging application. Or let's say a metric, right? Um, so a very simple metric application. All it does is spin up a REST service. And whenever we call the REST service, it uh, sends counters to our metrics collection service. I have a, a stack of uh, graphite and Grafana running in the background. And whenever we call this endpoint, it actually sends a counter called how many times you want to get and the machine name. And if we go to something slash ID, it sends the ID of the counter, right? And this will count application level metrics of how many requests we've served, how many different uh, containers are involved and stuff like that. Um, and if we run this, let's actually go ahead and run this somewhere, uh, like here. That's not a logos metrics. Um, there we go, it's running now in the background. Um, should be running in a second. <coughs> right. Now it should have sent some stuff to our login cluster. As you can see, yeah. Um, So the service spun up and, sp and uh, it wrote a bunch of logs and it wrote a bunch of metrics to our uh, collector. Just to show you what it looks like, it comes up and it shows and it sends a bunch of messages. So we have three copies of the service running and each one sends uh, a message called hello world, I'm up. But we have no idea which container actually sent it, right? We have no context of which container sent the message. Uh, the best we can do in this case is just count how many messages there are. Um, so there's no point trying to track which container sends which message unless you need to debug something specific that which is a problem in the container. Um, all you want to do is look at the overall aggregations of how many outputs or how many metrics this application is actually producing at any given time. Um, so going back to this. Um, so we talked a bit about managing resources. You saw that in the stack you can define how many resources your application actually takes. Um, that's really not, there's not much to talk about there besides scaling out. Uh, so every orchestrator, so Docker Swarm, Kubernetes lets you go and you specify how many resources uh, you give the application initially, what the upper limit, uh, how much it lets the application grow, and then it gives you some kind of way to go and scale out the application. So in our case, if we have a deployment of Kubernetes uh, like this, like what we saw earlier uh, in our deployment file, we started out with, let's say, uh, one replica here, right? So we can go and run this and then change it. So let's go here. Um, it's right here. Plus F, uh, apply, sorry.
service. Right. Right. So as you can see, it spun up one instance of this service. And now if you go and change it, uh, we can go and give it, let's say, three replicas now, right? And reapply the configuration. We'll see that two new ones just popped up, right? And so we can go and can scale them dynamically and just define the uh, configuration for your replicas, for your server size. We can go, we can, we can change any parameter here dynamically. Let's say we change this to a new image and then reapply the deployment. We'll see that now all of these uh, containers are going to actually uh, get killed and replaced by new versions, right? Uh, because we updated the base image, so it needs to actually go and spin down every one of the old containers and spin up a new version of every container. You can scale them up and down and uh, look at all this stuff. Um, right. So there's a few things to consider before we finish because we have exactly like two minutes left. Um, so I very much avoided talking about databases and state. You'll notice that all of my examples were stateless and it's very easy to do containers with stateless services because it's nice and wonderful and there are examples for everything. Databases on containers get very tricky and very messy, mostly because it's a, a simple database. So MySQL, MariaDB, anything that's a single node, that's easy enough. I wouldn't be worried about running that in, in Kubernetes. I just need to make sure it has enough resources and disk uh, IO to handle whatever we do with it. More complicated databases, anything that's clustered, let's say Kafka, Elasticsearch, Cassandra, any one of the clusterable databases uh, you might run in a big deployment. They're very tightly coupled to state. If a container goes away, it's a major disaster. It's not like a stateless service where a container goes away, comes back and nothing happened. If a database node goes away and comes back, it's a very hard uh, uh, rebalance that needs to move a lot of data around. It's not something that you want to happen just randomly. And so um, it's not that it's, it's impossible to deploy uh, large databases to Kubernetes, but it's very tricky. There's a lot of work involved. Our ops team took almost a year to actually get Kafka running on Kubernetes. Um, so this is something I'm not actually going to touch right now because it's more of a DevOps issue. It's not so much as a dev issue. And finally, secrets, right? Uh, we have exactly 20 seconds left. So I'll show you how to create a secret in uh, in Docker, and you can do pretty much the same thing in Kubernetes, right? What are secrets, passwords, SSH keys, anything you want your application to know, but you don't want the entire world to know. And so usually uh, companies have some kind of secret management infrastructure, so a vault or some kind of key manager. Uh, in Kubernetes or in, in Docker, you don't really have access, directly access to that, because the container can't identify itself and say, I'm allowed to have this key. So all the orchestrators come with their own infrastructure to provide secrets to containers. It's actually very straightforward to do. Uh, all we have to do is create a new secret. Go here. We have a password. Don't tell anyone. And then all we have to do is create Docker secret, create a new secret from this password. There's a secret that's stored, uh, encrypted in Docker Swarm in the manager. And then if we want to create a container and give it access to the secret, um, all we have to do is create our new service. And as you can see, we give it access to the secret named password. And once it spins up, the password will be in the secrets folder, right? So all we have to do is if we find the container and do ls on this folder, right? It's actually inside the container, right? Docker container exec runs the command inside the container. So the container can see the secret, right? It goes to slash run slash secrets password txt or password and the password exists. We can revoke, this, to revoke the secret. If we, if we delete the secret now from the service, the secret still exists. The service just doesn't have permissions to access the secret. And if we try to uh, go and access the secret again, again from inside the container, right? So we run this command inside the container it will tell us, no, that thing doesn't exist anymore, right? It doesn't see the secret anymore. So it's actually very straightforward to go and provide all of your secret keys and passwords to Docker. It works almost identically in Kubernetes. You create secrets and then you add them to deployment and tell them that this uh, deployment has access to this secret. And then it gets mounted as a uh, folder, which is only accessible to code inside the container and nobody outside the container. All right, I'm going to take a quick look at any questions we had.
we have no questions, which is excellent because I have no time either. So it worked out. Uh, but I'm All right, thank you very much. I'm actually happy to answer questions offline if you want to come over, but uh, I have to uh, get out of here uh, and let the next speaker talk. All right.